review just a little bit in our, our we began with the premise uh, open your Bibles for Philippians 2 we began with the premise that Christ was God okay and where does, where does Paul speak to that Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Okay? Uh, Paul wants you to understand the fact that Jesus is God. And at the point of the incarnation, Christ began what we will see is a continual descent into humiliation. Okay? And Paul's going to show that step by step, uh, act by act. So, uh, uh, first of all, Paul wants us to see that Christ had the essence of God. Alright? By that we mean that uh, He, has a, he had an existence of God and the essence of God, okay? The existence of God is, is, is spoken of in regards to Christ was God, and then the essence of God is uh, the idea that Jesus could possess the unchangeable nature of God. If you look at that first phrase in uh, verse 6, he was in the form of God, which means that he was equal. Okay? Can you, can you buy that? That he's equal to God? Jesus is equal to yeah. God. Okay. And then that's supported by numerous scriptures that we looked at last week. And really the deity of Christ is at the heart of Christianity. Remember we spoke about that. And whenever anybody attacks Christianity, they always attack who? They always attack Jesus Christ. Because if you can lessen Jesus then you can destroy, in essence, uh, the, the, the theory behind Christianity. So, the profound truth is God became man. Okay? That's what, that's what, that's what Paul is teaching us as we begin this, this lesson. And for him to become man, Christ had to empty himself. Okay? So, he emptied himself, and that's where we ended last week. But what did he empty himself of? Okay, before we begin that, I want us to understand what he did not empty himself of Christ did not empty himself of his deity. Okay? Christ was, Jesus was, coexistent with the Father and with the Spirit, even in his man state. Because Christ could never become less than God. Why? That would be a violation of what? The Trinity. If Christ became less than, than God or the Spirit, you would no longer have a Trinity. You would have a bi-entity, a two-headed uh, Godhead rather than a three-headed Godhead. So Christ could never be less than he always has been and always would be. And, and but don't get it, because some people, some, some uh, theologians will teach that there was an exchange made. And that Christ exchanged his deity for humanity. And that's wrong. Christ never did that. Okay? So, what did he empty himself of? First of all, we're going to say that he emptied himself of his privileges. I don't know if that's right or not. Privileges, okay? And uh, the first privilege that Christ gave up was glory. 
love the Lord. And by that I mean, uh, remember when we read C.S. Lewis last week and we said that Christ dived down underneath the water into the muck and the mud uh, of the earth? Christ, who existed in glory, gave up that glory when he became incarnate on earth. That's why John 17, 5, somebody look up John 17, 5. Tell me what it says. I hope you have a good translation. John 17, 5. And now will God glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the that's, world was. That's the only word I care about. Which the glory which I had. Jesus admits himself that he lost his glory. Okay? Uh, the glory which he had before the world began, or before the world was. Christ gave up, uh, okay, Christ gave up his face to face relationship with God, the glorious relationship that he had with God, and came to earth. Uh, Christ gave up the adoring presence of the angels. What do the angels do in heaven? They just, they just worship the Lord. They, you know, they just worship God continually. He gave that up. He gave up the shining brilliance of the heavens, and he emptied himself of his glory. And if you look in the Word, you can find circumstances and situations where you see his glory shine through a little bit. Most prominently where? On the Mount of Transfiguration. Okay? That's where Jesus gave, gave us a glimpse of that glory in Luke 9. And you can see it in his miracles. A glimpse. You can see it in his words. You definitely can see it at the cross at his resurrection, and most definitely at his ascension. But Christ emptied himself of his continual outward manifestation and personal enjoyment of his glory. If he hadn't, he would appear as who Jesus is, the glorious Jesus that he is. Another thing that he emptied himself of is his authority. Okay? Now, he emptied, him, he emptied himself of what I'll call his independent authority. He completely submitted himself to who? To the will of his Father. Amen. Because, and, and by doing that, which we'll look at later, he was able to become a servant. Do you think Christ is necessarily a servant in the Godhead? Not. He's king of kings and lord of lords. But he had to empty himself of his authority. And how did he do that? Well, if you look at Philippians 2 8, it tells you he made himself of no reputation. And in, in, in 8, he found himself, he humbled himself, and what did he become? Obedient. This, so. See, Christ doesn't buy the alibi that you can't be obedient. You know why? Because he was. So he doesn't buy the idea that you can't be obedient. So he was obedient. And he entered, uh, if you want to see examples of that, just think back to the garden where he said, not as I will, but as thou will. Okay? Not as I want to do, but as you want me to do, Father. And he learned obedience from the thing... Uh, Philippians, uh, or Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 8. What's your question? In the Bible, sometimes, as man, he kept saying, I thirst. So what he was thirsting for was that word. Yeah, sometimes he was just thirsty, too. Yeah. But he, he, yeah, he could be, he could be, he could thirst for that position. What does what Hebrews 5, 8 say? Somebody tell me. Oh, Yet, yet learn the obedience by the things which he suffered. 
Right. So how did God? So how did Jesus Christ learn obedience? What did, what did He just say? By what He suffered. How are you supposed to learn obedience? By what you suffer. But listen, what you want, what people want to do with their, what they suffer is, they want to internalize that suffering and keep it to themselves. And because they do that, you know what happens? They never get victory over that suffering. And that suffering, I know, I know folks that carry that suffering their entire lives. I've known people in their 70s that suffered in their teenage years and they still carry that same, and I'm not saying they, they, they say it, but they cover, carry that suffering their entire lives and it impacts who they are their entire life. Because they never give that suffering to the Lord. You know why? Because they're comfortable with it. It feels good. Yeah. And you know why? Because they are spiritually oppressed and they don't get victory over those things in their lives and they allow spiritual strongholds to develop in their life. And they complacently go along and they don't reach their true potential for the Lord because they never reach victory in those situations. Jesus suffered he made, that suffering made him obedient, and he had victory over all that suffering. There was nothing that held sway in his life. Uh, what does John 5.30 say? Somebody? seek my own will. I seek my Father's will. Jesus gave up. He emptied himself of his authority. The next one I want to call it prerogatives. Okay? Jesus uh, and you can think of them as divine prerogatives. Jesus set aside the prerogatives of his deity. What are the prerogatives of his deity? Those would be his natural attributes. Okay? So did Jesus stop being omniscient? Okay? When he came to earth? You're thinking. That's good for you. Keep thinking. Renee knows the answer. She has the same study I do. So she knows the answer. Did Jesus become omnis, 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 oh yeah. did, he, did he give up his ability to be all-knowing when he came to earth? No. When he wanted to be all-knowing, he was. Look at John 2. Look at John 2.25.
saying was nothing was good can come out of Nazareth. But then again, where Nathaniel was from, other people would say nothing good, good could come where he came from. And Philip said, Come and see. Then Jesus saw Nathaniel coming towards him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. And Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree. I saw you. So, yeah. Now, Jesus doesn't, Jesus, Jesus has these abilities, and because he never, remember, he never gave up his, uh, uh, his deity, but he exercises these abilities as per his Father's will. And he limits himself to the point uh, of not knowing everything that he knows. Matthew 24, 36. You know what that says that he doesn't know? When he was on earth, you know what he said he didn't know? Matthew 24, 36. But at that day and hour, no one knows. No, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. He didn't know. He, he restricted himself from knowing when he would return for his second coming. That's what that means. That's what that's talking about. So he had the ability to, to use his privileges or prerogatives as he desired, but he only used them according to his Father's will. So another thing that he emptied himself of was his riches. Is Jesus rich? You better know. He's so rich. Where he lives, they use gold to pave the streets. It's asphalt in heaven. That's how rich he is. So he emptied himself of those riches. He gave up all his personal riches. It says in 2 Corinthians 8 9, Though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich. Christ, how rich was Christ in this world? In that number. Own very little of anything. Another thing we kind of referred to it earlier, he emptied himself of his relationship. Okay? And by that we were speaking to the idea that uh, God, in 2 Corinthians 5.21 5, it says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on my on our behalf. Okay? So, he, he, since Jesus became sin, what did that do to his relationship with God at that particular moment? Yeah. There was a great schism in their relationship. And if you understand that, that's what, to me, the incarnation isn't as hard to understand as that is. What that did to the relationship, to the Trinity at that particular moment, when Christ became sin. Uh, that's why Christ uttered, my God, my God, why have, why have you forsaken me? At that particular moment. So, Christ renounced all of those privileges, but again, remember, he never ceased to be God. At any minute, at any, you know, if it had been me, if those guys would have started messing with me and hit me with that whip, I would have blasted them. I would have blasted them out of the universe. If they tried to pull on my beard, I would have just zapped them and said, there you go. I would have made him into a pig and made him run off to the street. Uh, I would have. Would you? Where would we be down? I would have. Jesus, look at I would have blasted those dudes, man. I would have given them like a Star Trek thing and boring them when they would have they went somewhere else. Put them in that machine and they would have been gone. So, so, so Christ emptied himself. So this is the process of his humiliation. He emptied himself. Okay? The process is over. The next thing he did is that he became he became a servant. Okay? 
became a servant. And it's in the in our text it says, who being from God, that's brother, he made himself of no taking the form of a servant, or some will say bond servant. And he became a servant, first of all, by nature. Okay? And it's important that we understand how he became a servant. When Christ emptied himself, he not only gave up his privileges, but he also, so he empties himself of his privileges. Remember I teach you that we're all 100% of something? Remember that? We've talked about that before. That your being, your inner, your essence is always 100%. You have the decision of what 100% you want to make it. You can make it 50-50. Well, 50, you can, you've got to make it at least 51-49. Because you have to be either of God or of Satan. You can't be evil. I'm going to teach Sunday night, there's no spiritual. When it comes to spirituality, there's no neutrality. You have to be of God or of Satan. So Christ emptied himself, so what did he fill that emptiness with? Well, first of all, he filled it with servanthood. He, he, and, and Paul again uses this word morphe in the Greek, remember? We looked at that word last week, I messed it up, but we looked at it. And morphe means the essential essence of something. Christ became the essence of a servant. Not ex merely externally, because Christ was a servant to everybody externally, right? He washed his disciples' feet. But external, the word in Greek, is not morphe, it's schema. And it means, to, it means an external manifestation. Remember I talked about we're humans. We have the morphe of humanity. But you can have the schema of, a, of an infant, a child, and a, a teenager, and an adult, and so on and so forth. So he became the form of a certain servant. It's not as if he put on a coat that he could take on and off. He became a servant by his nature. Jesus appears, uh, uh, in Mark 16, he, it, that's the only other place I think Morphe is used, and there he's, talk, he's spoken of in a resurrection body, which is a, is, which is a, 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 a whole other thought complete. But in Philippians 2, Christ is shown as a true bondservant who does the will of his Father, and he's submitted to the Father because Jesus is submitted to the Father because of me and you. That's why. He submitted to be a servant of his Father because of us. Because we had the need of him to help us conquer sin. So, uh, he submitted to... Uh, and see, that was the hard part for the Jewish mind to, to ever understand. The Messiah who's a servant. Never could. Still haven't figured that part out. Just never could. Now one day when they are illuminated, they'll finally understand who they killed and how they killed them. During the end times, and then there'll be a, a reconciliation to that thought process. So he became a servant by nature. He became a servant by position. Okay? And Christ, who owns everything, came into the world. And when he came into the world, as we've discussed, he became a servant by position because he didn't have anything. He didn't have a place to be born. He didn't have a place to sleep. You know where Jesus slept the majority of the time when he was around Jerusalem? Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives. That's where he hung out. You get a, a picture of the geographic area and you can see that was kind of his, his Jerusalem headquarters. He, when he had to cross the Sea of Galilee, what did he need? A boat? He had to borrow one. He didn't have his own boat. Uh, when uh, when he had to ride into the city of Jerusalem in triumphant entry, what did he do? Had to borrow a yeah. When he uh, 
when he was uh, buried, where was he buried? Was it somebody else's tomb. In a tomb that belonged to somebody else that they let him use for his burial. When they had the Passover meal, where did they go? They went to some, somebody's house and used a room upstairs. So, the only person who ever lived on the earth who had the right to everything wound up with He has everything. He gives everything up, and he ends up with nothing. Well, he gets our sins. That's always the best part of the deal. He gets our sins. We get his glory. Wow, what a trade. We really made out on that deal. So the King of kings, Lord of all lords, the rightful heir of David's throne, God in human flesh, had no advantages, no privileges in this world. He was given little, if anything, but he served everyone. And that's the uh, that's what's spoken of when you look at John 1, 3. It says, all things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. He's the creator. But he became a servant. This is the process of his humiliation. So what happened to him next? Well, he took the form of a bond's servant, and it says that he came into the likeness of men. Christ was made into the likeness, which means the sameness of man. Uh, in uh, Greek, it's uh, hoimoios. Hoimoios. Uh, so the descent of Christ continues as you move through these verses. Because remember, the subject here is the exaltation of Christ. But before you get Christ exalted, he's exalted because of his humility. And he was given these, uh, he was given, since he became homogeneous to us, uh, he had all manly attributes. He was, uh, he was more than God in a body. He became the God-man. He was fully God, and he was fully man. Just like man, any other man, Jesus was born. And in Luke 50, uh, 2, 52, it says that he increased in wisdom and in maturity. But he uh, became, uh, somehow he became a, a fleshly body. Uh, Colossians 1.22 said that Christ has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. That means that Christ, in the death of his flesh, reconciled you to his Father. Galatians 4, 4, God sent his Son born of a woman, born under the law, wanting you to understand he was born of a woman, he was born under the law. Hebrews 2, 14, since the children shared in flesh and blood, he himself also partook of the same. He was just like us. He became of flesh and blood. When he came into the world, he had normal flesh that felt all the effects of the fall, just like us. He was just like us. He had the same temptations, the same trials. He knew sorrow, okay? He had friends that died. He knew sorrow. He knew suffering. He suffered. He knew pain. He knew thirst. He knew hunger, okay? 40 days in the wilderness. He knew death. He had friends that died. He felt all the effects of the fall without ever knowing or experiencing one thing that the fall produced in all of us. Sin. That's the one thing. That's the one experience that he didn't experience. He was subject to it. It was placed before him. He could have
Christ, it says, Christ was found to be in appearance as a man. Okay. Think about it. God comes to earth and ends up looking like a man. How does that work? What does that feel like on the scale of 1 to 10 in the area of humility? Uh, you know, if you look at the end of 7, he says, coming in the likeness of man. And then he says, and being found in the appearance as a man. They almost sound like the same. But I think Paul reiterates it, saying that he's in the appearance of the man because he wants us to understand uh, that there's a difference between that 7th chapter or verse and that 8th verse. He shifts the, the, the focus uh, from the viewpoint of those to the viewpoint of those who saw Jesus. Christ, Jesus was a God-man, but how did he look? He looked like a man. He had the schema, okay? The outward appearance of a man. So how humiliating do you think that would be for God? To have the outward appearance of a man. Paul was implying that through Christ, that though Christ appeared like a man, uh, he wants you to understand that there's still more to him than the people who saw him then. Because how did they see him then? They didn't see him the way he was. Christ becoming a man was humbling him enough. But do you think it was humiliating for him not to be recognized? What did he tell people? I'm the son of God. Didn't he tell them that? And what did they tell him? You're a lunatic. You're crazy. How can you say those things? You know, if you look at the scriptures, John 8, 48, you are a Samaritan, Samaritan and you have a demon. Man, I wouldn't want to be that dude. That was a bad word. Uh, other words, uh, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he know and say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus told them who he was. He wanted them to recognize who he was, didn't he? He wanted them to recognize he was the Son of God. But did they? So that, that had to be humiliating for him. But why didn't they recognize him?
Well, what does that mean? Well, he didn't fight back. Kind of like I was speaking of earlier. He, you know, when they were beating up on him, like I said, he could have he could have zapped them, but he didn't. Uh, he could have demanded his Miranda rights. You know, could have uh, just pulled Stevens out. There you go. Could have zapped him. You know, at the trial of Christ, what did what did he say? They asked him if he was the king of the Jews and what he said. No. He said, you, uh, what, you, what you have said, or something to that effect. Yeah. yeah, what you have said. So, even there he doesn't profess his innocence. They mocked him, they punched him, they pulled out his beard, they treated him like a scum, they spit on him, they whipped him. And he didn't say anything. So, remember, so this is the pathway of his humiliation. He emptied himself, he became a servant, he became, a, he became subject to sin, if he had subjected to it. He became like a man, he humbled himself, and then, what does it, next, what does it say next? He was obedient, he obeyed, to the point of death. So the humiliation is getting pretty bad. He was obedient to the point of death. And no time did he say, that's enough, stop. Uh, he didn't ask them to leave him alone. He was obedient to the point of death. As, as Lewis said, descending down into that muck and slime. And then, and not only was he obedient to the point of death, but death on the cross. The most cruel way to kill somebody that's ever been conceived by mankind, originally practiced by the Persians, adopted by the Romans, used to exhibit, uh, execute rebellious slaves and the worst of the criminals. The Jewish people hated uh, crucifixion because in Deuteronomy 21-23 it says, anyone who is hung on the tree is under God's curse.
emphasize what he did. Uh, the idea, though, is, uh, you know, was there a point, was, I wonder if there was ever a point where he considered, this is too degrading, this is too humiliating. I'm, uh, I'm at a, a point where, uh, in 94 he said, yeah. if you can take this from take it me, away from me, not my will be yours. He That's the bad one. go to the cross. It wasn't his choice. No. No. That was his father's will. Your We're going to talk about it. I think we're going to talk about it Sunday morning in Romans 11:33, as we begin in chapter 11 of Romans. But at the end of uh, you know chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans, Paul speaks to the to the to the nation Israel and to the Jews, and he concludes that section. It's kind of like with a benediction or a uh, it's kind of almost like with a psalm. And he says in 11:30, he says. Oh, how the depths of riches of both wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and, his un and unfathomable his ways. See, that speaks to the idea. See, God came up with a plan that you and I would have never had. If we had been in charge of the plan, if I had, char if I had been in charge of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus would have been born in a palace or a nice house. He wouldn't have been born in the state. If I had been charged, he'd been wealthy. He'd been prominent. He'd be something, someone that people naturally looked up to. He would have a great education. He wouldn't be a carpenter. He would be, uh, he'd be uh, loved by people, revered by people, respected by people. He wouldn't have been born in a stable to a family in poverty and spend his time uh, in an obscure town with a bunch of <coughs> right, really right tag his followers, you know, disciples. They were they were a group of people. They were some dudes. You know, fishermen weren't weren't very highly thought of. Uh, tax collectors, you know, those kind of guys. Uh, well, government workers. Not these not these non essential government workers. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, pretty much. They expected uh, a lot more than he gave him, or that he appeared to be. Yeah, I would mess it up if I missed the job. So here's the test question. Okay? And then we'll close this section. And then we'll start on the next one. Next week. Do these questions, Renee? Yes. Okay. Um, this is from a study from uh, John MacArthur. So that's what I consider to be a Bible study. Uh, what was the perfect illustration of Paul's? Uh, and go back to two, three, and four in Philippians. He says in two, three, and four. What is Paul talking about? It, it, he's really talking about you know, unity. Okay, that's the, the overriding subject here. But in 2 3, he says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So he, te he tells you, You need to do this. Okay? All right? So how, Paul never tells you you need to do this unless he tells you how to do this. So how does he tell you to do it? Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Huh? Yeah. That's how you can do that. That's how you can love people you hate. Or dislike. We like to use dislike. Yes. Yes, for God's love and he gives it to you and you like it. I could change a sermon on that subject matter. How you love people you don't like. Because you can. That's what the word says. And if you think you can like everybody, I don't know, you might be glorified. Because uh, dude, it's, 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 
if I, if I sat down and talked to you about it, you probably, I'd be, probably be able to give you an example of someone that you don't like, but you can't love. In 2.6, Paul then began this whole, when we started, what was the first thing we said? That Jesus Christ is God. And what does the Greek word morphe mean? It means to be in the essential form. Essence. The essence, yes. And why, that, why is that important? We need to understand that's who Christ is. He's in the essence of God. But his form was a man. And uh, what does it, so you have the same word for form. You just translate it different places in the Bible. Somewhere it's schema. When you read it in English, it's form. Other places it's morphe. It means, when we read it in English, it's form. But morphe means the essence, and schema means the outside appearance. So when you read that word form in English, unless you know that, you don't know how to differentiate between the two. So it's important. Uh, Pastor, do you think Christians that don't know the
look out for other people's interests before you look out for your own interests. That's hard for us sometimes. But that's what, that's what Paul wanted us to understand. Okay. And then the only other part is, he died in obedience to his Father. He, he went to the point of death, death on the cross, and he told us that we're supposed to do what with that cross? You're supposed to pick it up every day. Die to yourself and let him live 